Let's go to the house of the Lord. Let our feet stand in your gates. Let us go to... Hey, National Park Church. Uh, here, continuing our Sermon on the Mount series. Uh, looks like you got me to, to close it out for a while. I know we, we mentioned last week I, I miss my buddy uh, Paul, um, <laughs> engaging with him and getting the dialogue uh, with him. But it's going to be uh, us together talking about a really uh, well-known passage from Matthew chapter 7. I'm guessing that you could be... Uh, a Christian or not a Christian, and know the content of this verse. And even when I just say um, its description, you would be able to immediately have the verse pop into your head. We're going to be talking a golden rule. And I'm excited about this conversation uh, and thinking through this. There's a, there's a sense at which it is very simple and uh, concise, and it has that quality of inexhaustibility that it always leads to more questions if you're taking seriously that I want to engage with the golden rule. So ex very excited about having this conversation tonight for our Wednesday night class. Will you join me in prayer and then we'll dive in to Matthew chapter 7. Let's pray. God, you are good and you love us and you extend grace to us day in and day out. I pray that you will Help us to love one another with the kind of love that's reflected in Jesus Christ. Help us to live out the golden rule in big and small ways. Help it to be the, the concept that shapes how we engage with everyone that we come in contact with. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. It's fascinating, this, this idea of the golden rule uh, can be found actually in a lot of different um, religions. Some, some form that sounds eerily similar to the words of Jesus, of do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Uh, it's such a famous uh, idea and concept. It's, it's one that you probably heard from your teachers and from your parents growing up, this idea of you should treat other people the way that you want to be treated. So that should be the underlying foundation of all of your actions. How would you want to be treated? Well, do likewise to that person. As I was thinking about this class, I remembered an episode uh, in my life as a, as a kid. So I was uh, wired to be a debater as a kid. I, I I always wanted to kind of wrestle and play the devil's advocate, especially when it came to church questions. I, I know that youth ministers and youth interns uh, used to kind of cringe when I would raise my hand in class because they knew it was going to be some off-the-wall, obscure question, uh, and that was just my personality and my makeup. But I remember in my living room trying to argue with my dad that Doing unto others as you would have them do unto you meant that if someone had done something to me, let's say a friend pushed me down or hit me or said something mean, I was trying to say, well, they've told me how they want to be treated, so I can treat them that way too. So I can do likewise to them because, hey, they, they treated me badly, which I guess if they're following the golden rule, they're telling me that this is how they want me to treat them. So why can't I do the same? Of course, my logic is deeply faulty and problematic, but um, as a, I think, middle school or elementary kid, I thought I was pretty slick with my arguing skills, saying, well, I don't actually have to love people very well because they've told me this is how they want to be treated. I'm going to treat them that way. Um, but I think we need to think, of course, much more deeply than I did uh, as a kid, but even maybe more deeply than we've tended to think about this text in the past. So one way you could interpret this passage is, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And you go around uh, the world thinking, how would I like to be treated in this moment? And do the very action that you would want someone to do to you in that moment. And you go, well, that sounds like a direct 
description of what the text says. So that's pretty obvious, Taylor. If we're sitting here and that's all you're going to tell us tonight, that's not very helpful. But I think that may be too simplistic of a response to the text. Let me try to explain. If I'm preoccupied primarily in the details and the particular actions I'm going to do and reflecting how would I like someone to engage with me in this situation, I may superimpose my natural tendencies and my wants and needs onto another person. I'll try to give an example. And, and there's some good resources uh, online that, that engage with this idea but think if you're an extrovert. I heard someone use this analogy in a TED Talk. Imagine if you're an extrovert and you're at a, a gathering where you don't know a lot of people. Well, if you're an extrovert, what you want is you want to be brought into the, the, the big uh, aura of the party as a whole. Like you want to meet as many people as possible. You want to be in the, the action in the middle of everything. And so Someone who's looking at you, and if, 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 if you're an extrovert, your natural reaction is, I want to grab that person, put them at center stage, and have everybody meet them all at once. And you would, that's going to be the most loving thing, because I would be desperate for somebody to do that for me if I was in their situation. Well, think about it for a moment. Imagine the person you're going to now take and, and introduce them to everybody and put them at the center of the party. What if they're an introvert? In that moment, it could be the most terrifying experience ever. Especially, what if they found somebody over in the corner and they're talking to them and they're having a great conversation, but you feel bad for them because, man, it doesn't look like they're part of everything that's going on in the larger party, and you take them away from that conversation. To you, that may be exactly what you wanted to have happen. But to them, that may be the exact opposite of what they needed in that moment. I think as we think about the golden rule, Yes, the truth that Jesus lays out is beautiful and good, but I think we need to frame. He's not saying do unto others as you would have them do unto you, merely in imagine what particular actions you would want in that moment and then do those actions. No, it goes one step deeper. How would you want someone to treat you? Well, I can imagine that you would want somebody to know you well enough to try to share uh, either a word or an action or some kind of uh, engagement with you that reflected that they understood the kind of person that you are. So the deep root is, how do we want to treat one another? Well, not merely doing the actions that I would want have done to me, but it's that deep underlying issue of, I would want someone to care about me enough to engage with me in a manner that's going to be for my flourishing and for my good. I know that may feel a little complex. What are, you, what are you trying to get at? I think sometimes we have a false assumption that if it would be good for me to be engaged in this way, if it would be good for me to some, for someone to treat me in this particular manner, if it would be good for somebody to show affection and love in this particular means, that means it would be universally good for everybody to encounter it in the same way. And so let's try to give another example. Imagine if you're in a, a marriage and you're wired to, to need quality time and for people to process things with you. So when you have an anxious moment at work, when you have a difficulty that's taking place in your life, you're the kind of person where you feel so loved when someone says, I got 45 minutes, an hour, two hours to sit down and process and talk with you. And so that's what you need in that moment. And you're so desperate for that. So when anybody says, I got that time, you feel more loved than you could possibly imagine. But imagine if you then are engaging with somebody who in moments of deep hurt or processing through a difficulty that's happening in their life is not one who needs to talk for two hours or for uh, an extended period of time, who needs someone to, to be willing to say, I can just give you a big hug. And I can be patient and I can just sit here with you. Now imagine if you thought, that person needs a long conversation. They need to talk it out. And you keep trying to pry it out and pry it out and pry it out and pry it out. Come on, talk to me. This is what, we, what you need. This is what you ultimately need. 
Well, you may be doing a loving action. You may be trying to love that person. You may be trying to do unto them as you would have it be done to you. But in the end, you end up imposing your particular need and what you would particularly want in that situation rather than seeking what is good for them in that particular moment. I think that most of the time when we have tension with one another, especially when we have moments where we feel like we're really trying to love but we're just missing each other, it's not necessarily because either party is right or wrong. I think oftentimes it's because each party tends to impose the way they would like to receive something, the way they would like to get something, the way they would like to be treated upon another person. Rather than, my job if I'm following the golden rule is to get to know the person I'm in relationship with so well that I can adapt to be the kind of person they, they need me to be, not try to emulate what I would want them to do for me in this, in, in this particular situation. That can be really difficult, and that requires a lot more effort and a lot more intentionality. So for those of us that have very direct, and as Paul and I, if Paul and I were having this conversation, because we've talked about it a lot, uh, a more confrontational, we're just going to get at it and we're going to work it out type of personality. What, what, what you may want in that moment is, if we have conflict, I want somebody to come to me and directly just say, this is how I feel, this is what you did to me, and I'm so frustrated about it. And so you go, that's what I'm going to do with everybody else. The difficulty with that is you now may be engaging with somebody else where you just lay it all out, and they're not wired like you at all. And what they now feel is they got this burden, and they're the, the peacemaking type. So instead of really sharing with you their heart or where they've been hurt, they now feel like they need to apologize and um, make sense of this really intense engagement. The goal of the golden rule is that I will be the kind of person that's looking at the world saying, how would I want to be treated? I would want someone to know me well enough to engage with me the way that would be most conducive for me. I think that my dad taught me a really good lesson growing up. Um, we tend to live in a world that is very much black and white. There are right things to do and there's wrong things to do. And that exists and there's no question about it. And anybody that tells you that there are no, this is what you should do and this is what you shouldn't do are misleading but I do think a lot of life, and the majority of life, is about prudential wisdom and about what is the best thing I can do in the situation. Not about if I did the alternative, it would be wrong, or if I do this, I've accessed the perfect right answer, but what is the best thing to do in this particular situation? And I think for us, the best thing to do in a particular situation is to not seek this generic right or wrong but what's redemptive in that moment? What's, what's redemptive? What's going to seek the good of the person that I'm engaging with? And that's going to allow, that's going to force me outside of myself to ask not just how do I inhabit the world, what do I, what feels best to me and what, what brings me comfort and flourishing, but to genuinely try to use the cliche phrase to step into the shoes of another person. To ask the question, what does that person need in that very moment? I think that adds a, a, a layer to this situation. It adds a, a, another thing for us to, to contemplate and think about. And I, I would invite you to think about, have there been moments in your life where you thought, I really tried to love that person. I tried to do the golden rule and it ended really badly. Maybe ask the question, did I do the work of trying to understand that person so that when I engaged with them, when I tried to show love to them, when I tried to treat them in a particular way, I was treating in a way that was conducive to their unique individuality? Or was I engaging with them in a way that I would have liked someone to engage with me? I hope you get the subtle distinction there. The golden rule is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Meaning, what you ultimately want from another person 
is for them to know you well enough to know that in this moment, if you treat me this way, if you do this, if you, if you engage with me in this manner, that's going to be most conducive to my flourishing. Are those not the healthiest marriages and the healthiest relationships? When the question is not primarily trying to make the other person respond to things in the same manner that I would, to want the same things in every situation that I want. No, it's learning the other person so that you know this is what they need in that particular moment. The golden rule is that step. Doing unto others as you would have them do unto you is the movement of saying, I want to treat that person in such a way that I'm giving them what they need. Not what I would have needed if I was in that situation, but what they need in that particular moment. And can I just give a, a wide picture? That has the potential to radically change the relationships you're in. Most of our tension comes from, we assume everybody is monolithic, meaning everybody is the exact same. And so they're going to respond the same. And if I like this, then they are probably going to like this. If I need this, they probably need this. But the more we engage with other people, the more we find it's a pretty complex situation because two people can drastically need different responses even if they're experiencing something immensely similar. And the kind of person who's able to do the golden rule well is the kind of person who can navigate, who can know, who can step outside of themselves to be able to appreciate the experiences of others and the needs of others. So my invitation this week with Jesus is be the kind of person who's passionate about taking that step in embodying the golden rule in your life. Because I can imagine it will radically reshape the way you engage in the world and the relationships that you're in. Love you guys. Have a great week. Let our feet stand in.